I'm joined today by one of the most exciting BMX freestyle riders on the planet. A child prodigy on his BMX bike and now a nine-time world champion and Olympic torchbearer for the games held in his home city. Today's guest has transcended his sport and become a superstar in so many fields. It is our absolute pleasure, Matthias, to welcome you to Just Ride. Hi. <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing very well. I just had my croissant. I'm ready for the day. I'm ready for the day. It's been an incredible uh, few days at the Olympic and very happy. This is uh, the home Olympic and the French team is doing so well. And it's been a great few days for BMX as well. So all good here. Yeah, I was, <laughs> uh, I was laughing that you came in and the first thing you did is grab a coffee and two croissants oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> this is my morning routine <laughs> so i want to start because you do you're like this incredible bike rider but you are just a superstar kind of like all around so when you introduce yourself like how do you describe yourself if you first meet people <laughs> Imagine, hey, I'm a superstar. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> so, I'm sure that's actually how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matthias. I'm a superstar. Nice to meet you. Uh, no, uh, you know, everything kind of happens step by step. I'm just a goof, still a goofy kid that loves to ride my BMX bike. And then, like, life kind of happened, you know, and I had the chance to have so many opportunities that get my way uh, thanks to BMX so I'm just a goofy kid that ride my bike <laughs> <laughs> I I feel like that's actually a bit true <laughs> yes it is <laughs> I'm not lying I mean it's like minute one of the podcast I'm not gonna start like now maybe a bit later <laughs> okay so I do want to I want to like get into your your life and your story and all of the other things but on just ride one of the things that we do is go through a bunch of different disciplines, um, introduce myself and usually Rob uh, to the disciplines. And I want to talk about Flatland. So I guess, how would you, how would you describe Flatland? Like what is Flatland BMX? You know, it's uh, it would be literally like ballet on a bicycle. I mean, I used to hate that term and so many people, you know, growing up say, oh, you are like a ballerina on a bike. I'm like, no, I'm... I'm a tough dude, okay? I'm not I'm not dancing. And when you look at it from a, a bigger perspective, it is dancing on a bike. And it's crazy because that uh, aspect of my discipline, I didn't get until very recently that it's beautiful. And it's not only like a gnarly sport, it's also beautiful. So I'd say it's dancing on a bike on two worlds and I'm dancing on my pegs. <laughs> I, I do feel like it's uh, like when I watch it, I remember like growing up and we were talking about it before, the, before uh, we started recording about how like Flatland is the introduction. Like you start riding and you try to do a manual or a bunny hop or whatever. Um, could you because I don't know like what a hard trick is. Could you describe Flatland in like five levels so it's like level one is what like a manual or something and then like what is level five like what does it take for yeah. you to win a world championship it's really interesting that you mentioned that flatland is the is the mother of all bmx discipline because usually the process of every rider is getting a bike somehow and then starting to ride on in on your front porch pretty much and that's flatland and so i would say yeah the first trick is of obviously a wheelie and that's still today like when kids passing passing me by and say hey papa wheelie papa wheelie wheelies like 50 years later they are still prominent <laughs> it's still the tricks they're to still do. in yeah <laughs> just, i'm just doing all this crazy stuff and like can you do a wheelie bro i'm like oh, yeah try <laughs> i work so hard for all of this other stuff <laughs> so the wheelie it's still uh it's level one but still you know uh i think a manual it's really really good to understand like everything on the on the bike and it's the the basic and then i would say level two is a uh, hang five uh, would be like you know balancing on your front wheel on your front peg this one is pretty hard and mm -hmm. pretty frustrating because you are always like crashing forward like hurting your wrist and then level two would be like the the spinny the spinning you know we do a lot of tricks spinning and uh, you have to get used to that because so many people are like oh don't you get dizzy it's crazy and actually i don't get dizzy anymore unless i don't ride my bike for a week and then i start riding again so you can like train it out of yeah you. oh yeah oh, for sure because you look at your um uh front wheel or back wheel when you spin so you, you're not 
disoriented. Oh, so, no way. Yeah. So you can train that. And so many people are like, oh, how you're not like throwing up after a run. I'm like, I'm just used to spin like all day long. And um, level four would be incorporating a street aspect to Flatland. And that's what I, I started doing in, uh, in 2010 when everyone was doing like tricks on the ground. I was like, oh, no, we can do like stuff from bunny up, like maybe doing a full cab into like a flatland trick. And I feel like that was mm. my thing. And that's not easy to do because doing tricks out of a bunny up takes a lot of energy. So that's that's when the gym work came in and, uh, you know, it was pretty cool. And level five, it's uh, where the Japan is at right now. It's the bike flips. So basically now, like eight years old kid in Japan, they are like doing a manual literally like throwing their bike in the air, like flipping 360 and land back into a manual. And you're like, okay, I'm not doing <laughs> that, guys. <laughs> no, this is crazy. Because bike flips, you know, so you flip your bike and you either grab the, the pegs or the handlebar, but the bike come at you so fast and it, I can't, it hurt my, my hand. It's crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they do that so naturally and that's what the next generation is, is incredible. They are taking Flatland to new heights and, it's been insane to watch my discipline grow the past uh, 10 years. And I'm, I'm super proud to have been one of the, the, the pioneers of that. And now, like, literally a hundred of kids are, are better than me uh, technically at that. Mm. And I'm super proud of that. Yeah, it's so cool. And it's, it's crazy that level two is a hang five because I, like, can't even imagine, <laughs> imagine doing even that. But if you were to say, so like you have the individual kind of tricks and things like that, but it's more than that because you have to put it together in a routine. So how does the, how do the competitions work? Like how does a world championship work? Yeah. Uh, great question. Cause so before BMX wa was incorporated into the Olympic, we talk about uh, BMX park, um, the competition, they were unregulated. And from 2017 on the UCI came in. And they said, since you guys are going to the Olympic, we are going to structure the sport. And at first, everyone was like, oh, they are going to take away our culture and everything. When we fast forward, it's been incredible because we needed a uh, structure. We needed like judging criteria and everything. So it's been great. And now the official competition run by the UCI, uh, as far as Flatland is concerned, is on three days. On Friday, we have qualification. It's a three minute run. And let's say there is like 80 dudes entering the competition. They take 16 riders for the semifinals on Saturday. Uh, again, another three minute run. And they take eight for the final. This one's gnarly. From 16 to eight, it's gnarly. And then final on Sunday, three minutes. And, uh, and we have a winner on the, the criteria of uh, judgments. The highest is the originality. Because it's very important for Flatland that you invent your own trick. You can pull the craziest run technically, but if it's not your own tricks, you're never going to win. You might not get top five. Interesting. So, yeah. So did you, you mean like actual, like how many tricks, have you invented any tricks? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how many have you I've, invented, Matthias? Uh, I don't know, maybe like 25, 30, something like that. No way. Yeah. Maybe. There is some years where you are, like more, you know, into it. And now maybe I just do one a year recently, one big one a year. I'm working on one big one a year. But yeah, in my in my 20s, I was like on fire, you know, yeah. because I don't know, since I was doing the street thing and I was the only one doing it back then, Yeah, it was, dude, every, every two months, I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah. And then you're pulling this trick at a competition. And, and that was so fun for me because you knew, you knew that big competition was coming and you're like, I'm going to work on this trick for this competition, it comes, you pull the trick and you're like, what's next? Because you cannot really right. pull the same trick at the next competition. So you always have to. That's to crazy that it, that it, like the innovation happens so fast. Like, um, I feel like so much of the time you, you have the same tricks and they're done in different places, but a flatland, I mean, it's just all flat ground. And so, yeah, exactly. And, uh, that's what so good about flatland is when you talk about, let's say BMX big air where you're like, I'm going to try to add one tail whip to that. Right. And you're limited by the time that you are in the air. So it's pretty tough. And it's been like crazy to watch, uh, big air, like develop into a craziness. But with flatland, what's good is like, you are not limited whatsoever. Mm. 
and it's really up to you and your creativity. Like if you wanna, if you wanna try stuff out, it's crazy because you have to think outside of the box yeah. every day. And it's cliche to say that, but it's literally what it is. And it's really hard because there is so much footage now on Instagram, and I don't want to look at what others are doing. <laughs> do you hide? Do you try to like hide your? You know, oh, your, your for stuff. sure, for yeah. sure. And I try not to look at what the Japanese kids are doing right. now because I don't want this to kind of influence, influence me. And but it's, dude, it's hard to be creative. It's so hard, and there is no secret recipe for it. Mm. And it's not like you can go on your bike in the morning at the spot. You're not like, okay, dude, today we're gonna invent something because you are literally grabbing your handlebars. Like, what should I do today? It it doesn't work mm. like that. So what I try to do is do stuff outside of BMX, like go watch an art exhibition or like travel somewhere different, meet new people. And it kind of feeds your brain with new stuff. And when you're on your bike, it's like your brain is more open somehow, a new music, something like that. And you start riding and you're like, oh, this could actually work. And some of the tricks I invented were after like, a crazy trip that I've took where I didn't have my bike. And so after five days on that trip, I've so I've seen like new people, new landscape and you come back and your brain works better. It's crazy. You feel it. Mm -hmm. And so like you are on the spot, you invent this trick and it makes you win the next contest. So it's, it's a pretty cool, like little area of my work that I tremendously love. It's yeah. so fun. It's so much like art. Like, yeah, it is. Do you uh, do you have a signature style if we were to think about it in that way? Yeah, I uh, like lately I've been doing a lot of uh, no hander trick and uh, where I try to to hook uh, my body parts to my bike <laughs> and the the bike kind of stays on its own and it's been like so fun trying to be creative with that. But obviously the street uh, the street flat uh, style is one of my my signature. It's been so fun. So I want to go back because you grew up in Paris and it's interesting because I feel like flatland BMX isn't the first thing that like kids gravitate to. Tell me about that. Tell me about like growing up in Paris, the culture and like the bike culture and how that came to be. Yeah, back then flatland BMX was the last thing that kids would, would go to because there was literally nothing. It's a crazy story. It's honestly, I got so the stars aligned that day. So um, I think I'm 10 years old and I've, I'm playing soccer like every kid in my neighborhood. And uh, the coach is, uh, sorry, is <laughs> like he's, he thinks he's training PSG or something. Like he's <laughs> like, I know we are like a small suburb club. We are not going to go anywhere. We're just trying to have fun. And he's screaming at us like, dude, I'm going to give you this example. You're going to freak out. So our like, uh, team jerseys are red and when they wash it for like two years they become pink and one tournament they say if you lose the next game we're gonna make you play in pink because you're playing like girls oh and I'm, I'm eight years old dude oh my <laughs> so, I'm like, so we lose the game and they're, 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 so next man next match we all like wearing pink <laughs> and we're like, he did it. yeah he did it and um, and that it was a crazy tournament this one and we do really bad at this tournament and the last match is uh, to decide if we're going to get last or one place before last and it goes to the penalty shootout and I'm the last one to take the penalty and if, if I miss, we get last of the tournament. And dude, I still still vividly remember this moment. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still shocked by this moment and I want to go cross and I, uh, I I close my foot too much and the, the ball hits the post and we finish last and I'm, <laughs> and I'm wearing pink and I'm like, okay, that's it. That's a wrap, guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> For some reason, I knew you were going to say that you missed. <laughs> Definitely missed this one. So that day was a bummer. So like the week after, I'm like, ah, it's okay, it's... it's this is no, this is not what I want. And my, my dreams of being a professional soccer player kind of crushed there. And I'm watching TV that next week and I see a show that a famous show in France and uh, where people come and present their, what they do in life. It's a talk show, like whatever. And this guy comes in with a flatland BMX bike and he starts to do some tricks and explain that he's a professional and everything. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is so sick. Like, this guy looks like he doesn't need a coach and he's not wearing pink. And I'm like, 
this is it. Like, so I asked my parents for six months later for Christmas, hey, I'd love a bike, you know. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, you know. They, they, they thought it was going to be like a little phase. Like I was 12 years old, I think, or something like that, 10 or 12. And, uh, and they got me a bike and I started riding with my friends. And I found out through my friends that there is a professional rider that gives BMX flatland lesson five minutes from my parents' house in a, in a, it was, it was funny because he was actually a circus school, a legit circus school. And this guy had been really smart and took one of the, the, um, um spot to like train, uh, and, and give like BMX flatland lesson. So I found out I go, and it was amazing. It was like, so basically going to soccer, I was going on Saturday, Sunday, and Wednesdays. And I was just getting BMX platform lesson. And I found out later that it was the only place in Europe that wow. in 2002 that was, that had that. So, and it was five minutes away from my parents' house in the suburb. So that's what I say, the star aligned. Yeah. And so this guy explained me everything for two years and so that I, I had a little talent doing BMX and it's like, oh, you should start competing. And I started competing and, and the rest is, you know, we're talking right now. So yeah, it, we did yeah, pretty yeah. well. It worked out. It worked <laughs> out. It, it's interesting. Your, your story, it feels like that so much. Like, um, because what was it in 2008, you were kind of like, oh, should I continue? Like, I think you had just won world championships and, um, it was before you got on Red Bull. Exactly. Uh, so so I start to ride kind of more intensely in 2002. I win my first amateur competition in 2004. And this gives me a huge confidence boost. And I'm like, that was the first time I was winning something personally, you know. And from 2004 to 2006, I ride my bike so much. Did you have no idea? I was riding 10 hours a day during the holidays. like 10 hours? Yeah, dude. I was fainting on my spot from exhaust exhaustion. And yeah, it was... It was crazy in 2006, I'm, dude, I'm hot. I'm like so good on my bike. And I enter my first pro competition and I, and I win. It was a small pro competition, but I win. And then Alex Jumelin, who, who was a, a really good um, French professional rider back then, he literally takes me under his wing and is like, we're gonna take you around the world, uh, my, my son. <laughs> and, uh, and that was great because he got friends with my parents, mm. and so my parents trusted him to take me to like contest in Germany or Italy with him, because they wouldn't have, they would never have let me. I was like 16 years right, old. It's like yeah, you're not yeah, going to Germany alone, totally. you know. So like this guy had a massive influence on that. And 2007, I actually like win my first pro competition uh, on the tour, on the World Cup tour, and on that. Same weekend, I graduate. I graduate from high school. Wow! No so way. So literally, like, I fly to New Orleans um, on on Friday. The contest is on Saturday. I win the contest. Uh, the final was against Terry Adams, who is a, a fellow Red Bull athlete. We party so hard on Saturday because that was my first huge win. So I get on the flight on Sunday morning, like so hangover. My dad picks me up on Monday morning at the airport. He's like, dude, that's crazy, but we got to go check out if you got your results. <laughs> so we put the bike bag on this motorcycle like that. And we, we go to the, to the school with the results. And if I didn't graduate, I, I needed to do like another like exam or whatever. It's kind of would have been crazy, but I found my name on the list and I graduate. And that was the deal with my parents. If I graduate, I can kind of be a provider. Yeah, you know? sure. So I found my name. That weekend was insane. Yeah, what and a so wild time. Literally the next day, I'm like, okay, I found the spot in Paris to live with some friends. Bye, guys, I'm out. And so September 2007, I, uh, I, I moved to Paris and I was on Adidas back then. And I had a thousand euro per, uh, per month mm -hmm. to, but for everything, you know, like food, uh, food clothes. Uh, yeah, clothes, contest traveling, everything. Oh, so wow. from September 2007 until April 2008, I'm trying to make a living in Paris with 1,000 bucks, which is not working, obviously. So March 2008, I'm like, I might go back to my parents' house and st start like studies because I need a plan B, you know, I cannot like live like that. And again, the stars, the stars align because in April 2008, uh, Red Bull is finally allowed in France. 
and they are having this huge launch and they are asking three French athletes to help them launch the brand in the in, in France. I and remember, wasn't, didn't they do like a big, like mini Cooper thing? Yeah, exactly. Was, were you part of that? Yeah. So they had this massive mini Cooper, uh, on the Champs Elysees, yeah. on the Arc de Triomphe. Lueli Gegenschatz jumped from the, the Eiffel Tower with a parachute. And Julien Dupont, he rode over the Knit in La Défense, which was insane. And so I actually helped Julien carrying his motorcycle and everything. And this little launch for the, for the Red Bull team manager was kind of a personality test or whatever oh, sure. okay. to see if we were done with the brand and everything. And right after the, the, the French launch, they're like, hey, can you come to the office? They gave me a hat and you're like, you're officially like a Red Bull athlete. And I'm like, oh uh, my God, this is, you know, like, yeah. obviously I knew the brand because it was huge in our sport. Mm -hmm. And since, you know, 2004, I saw Vicky Gomez, Marty Coppa, Terry Adams, like all these Red Bull athletes. And it was my big dream, you know? And so when they give me the hat and they are like, yeah, so the, so that was April, 2008. And so until, um, December, 2008, like, yeah, we can help you with all your travel this year. Basically you have an unlimited travel budget. Oh, so that like fixed everything. Yeah, dude, that from one day to the other, everything Wild. was yeah. fixed. Yeah. I was like, oh my God. So I called my parents, I called my, my roommate. I'm like, oh, we're not moving. We, we're still in the game, guys. <laughs> we made it. We made, we made it. <laughs> kind of, you know, but. So still I had like to prove myself that, that, that I could be like a, a Red Bull athlete because obviously it's the cream of the crop, yeah. you know? Did you know that it was like a test or? I didn't, no, 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 no. So that was, that was pretty cool. And so that same year I win the, the, the year and the uh, world championship. And yeah, we had a massive party in November and they officialized my contract uh, 1st of January, 2009. And it's been, so we are in 2024, so it's been a minute I'm with the brand. And I was one of the French, if not the first French athlete. And I've, you know, it's been incredible to work with the brand. And I have such a special relationship with Red Bull. And I would say this even if we were doing a Vans podcast, because, yeah. you know, like you have to give credit what's due. Like they took me when I was a nobody and they raised me, like they teach me PR stuff, how to do athlete project how to, I don't know, everything. And the, uh, the access to the APC now, it's, it's the best part. Yeah. Like, it's the best part, yeah. honestly. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and that is, it's super interesting, Matthias, because not only, I want to go back to, like, you as a competitor, but you are just this incredible, like, creative mind, content creator. And I feel like you really latched onto that early, like, really understanding what it meant to, especially, like, early social media to be like, okay, I need to like put out clips. It's not just, you know, me winning contests. It's like, I need to, I need to be out there. I need to, I don't know, like create content and things like that. Where did you, how did you learn that? Like really good question because, uh, nowadays it's everything it's Insta and TikTok. It's sad, but it's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, but no, like my, uh, my mom, uh, used to love to take photos. And when I was going on summer camp, when I was like five, six years old, she was always giving me like those, uh, uh, those little cameras to take photos. And so I was exposed to photography really young. And when I started to become a professional BMX rider, like 15, 16 years old, you have your first interview in the magazine. And so you need to take, you need some photos to be taken of you, you know? So I worked with photographer really young and I tried to understand photography really young with them. And I was really interested in that. And same thing happened with video and I was trying to understand angles. And when they were taking photos of me, I was like talking so much with them. Like, how did you do that? How did you synchronize the flash? Why the flash speed cannot be like this high because of that. And I've learned on the spot photography. And so when Instagram came into the game in 2012, I think, um, I saw this app and was like, at first, Instagram was just a filter. Huh? Yeah, yeah. You were just taking a photo and you could put a filter on it. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know. Like, to put it back in the context, it's 2012. We didn't have that. Today, like, everyone has a filter on. But back then, it was the only app where you could kind of edit your photo and do, like, a, yeah, like, make it look cool. And I instantly loved really? it. Really? So yeah. you were, like, immediately when you saw it, this is like, oh, I want to I want to combine this with my riding. Yeah, exactly. And at first, I was just taking random photos of my cat. Of my, <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was just, I didn't think, oh, this can be a business, you know. Right. I, I was just, 
and I've always loved to share my life anyway. I, uh, I was running a, a little blog when I was like 17, 18, when I was traveling because I realized really young that I was, that I was so lucky to travel the, the world and I, I kind of wanted to exteriorize that by writing it online. And I think I have a very like sharing personality where I need to talk how I feel and I need to yeah, share with others. I don't know why it's not, maybe it's just to put myself in the, in the center of the, the game, but also like mentally it helps me to talk about that thing. So it was always natural for me to share things. So when Instagram became uh, bigger, I was like, this is the best way, you know, to, to share things. And when the game changed was when they started to, to um, uh, release the video Uh, thing on Instagram because at first it was just photos you remember yeah and I remember that day I was in San Diego with Dennis and Arson and yeah. Chad Carly and we saw that this fe this feature came in and it was only like 15 seconds video yeah back then and square 15 second video and we looked at each other I was like okay so that's gonna be the new video wow now. That was, I think, 2015, 2016. Yeah, because like those dudes, like Dennis Anderson, Chuck Hurley, like, and, and you as well, like the thing that you used to do, I was talking to my brother about this, like you mentioned, you know, maybe you get, if you're super lucky, like you get a cover or like maybe it's an interview in a magazine or, or a spread. Um, and he was like, you know, I used to do these tricks that would be like a two page spread and like ride BMX. And now that's an Instagram clip. And so there's this like really interesting progression where you, yeah, you had to have like a photographer with you like all the time and all of that stuff. Like, I don't know that I, that is just blows my mind that you guys latched onto that so quickly because it's such a different format. He, it was not like super quick because we, there was an evolution, you know, sure, but yeah. now it's, yeah, it's everything. And there is really like a few dudes now that release full on video parts. Right. So we went from an era where road fools were, you know, they were going on trip for like maybe two months and release like a DVD that everyone was watching. And then it goes into YouTube. So everyone is like filming YouTube videos for like a year. Maybe they are filming and release the video. And I think this died too, because <laughs> everyone is in the culture of the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's this only sad thing about social media clips now is that there is only a few dudes that take the time to to film video part and yeah Dennis and Arson is a very good example he puts out a crazy video part every year yeah and and he tells me but it's for me it's great because I put the video part and then I got so many clips to share sure on on my on my insta for like one year maybe I'm right. like that's a great way to look at it yeah and he, he got injured like six months ago and looking at his instagram feed it doesn't look like he got injured because he had so much mm clips that uh in advance same with brock rayford yeah like he had a pretty bad uh um knee uh, injury at x games like a year and a half ago and he's still posting content that he filmed and i think that's great but to go back to the subject yes like now video parts are just putting being put out on, on instagram and we have to take the positive of this is that we get to see crazy content but that that yeah that brought the sport to another dimension mm. where the graal back then was to get the cover right bmx and the graal today is getting a million views on <laughs> right. uh, it's which comparable. is crazy yeah it's for comparable sure, for like, sure. i got a million view of that on that clip and you are very proud and you're like posting it out and you are as proud of as those million views as you were of a, a cover, cover of a magazine you know so for sure It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is so crazy. And I, you mentioned it before, but like your street influence. So like you have dudes like that, like a Garrett Reynolds and things, and you're the combination of a flatland and street. Um, like you mentioned that now, but I think that that was like so early because you, I heard you say that you like loved street and you were like really like kind of going pretty hard at it. Um, and then you got injured, like, Just tell me about, tell me about the, maybe a little bit of the difference between like Flatland and Street yeah, of, and just of why you like so, so much. Why did I pick up Street in the first place? Because I was doing so well at Flatland and I could have just stayed at Flatland. <laughs> at you Flatland had just beat every, yeah. you had finished it. And, and so I think it was 2010 maybe. Uh, so I won the world championship in 2008, 2009, I think maybe 2010. And 
I started going to competition and doing really well. But since I've, I would have won so much competition for three years, every time I was doing a little mistake, they would put me like third place, even though my run was still better than second right, place. Sure. Uh, they would, they would love to see the guy who wins everything kind of fall, you know, mm. and that really pissed me off. Yeah. Cause like, it's a judge sport. Like. Yeah. It's a judge sport. And back then the judges were not as, uh, as fair, let's say, like as, it was just as like today. somebody like leaning back in their chair. Eh, I think that that was uh, eighty five yeah, or something. <laughs> exactly, and so that really frustrated me. And I needed something new because otherwise I would have stopped riding BMX Platon because I'm such a big competitor. Like it's crazy. Like I don't know why, but mm -hmm. I don't know where that come from. But if we're gonna play a game of card, and if I lose, I'm gonna be mad for the rest <laughs> of the day. So. So anyway, this situation brought me to, okay, I need to experience something new on my bike. And uh, the spot I was training at in Paris, in Bastille, some street guys, it was just like three stairs and some bench. And I saw them and we became friends. I was like, oh, why don't you like ride with us? And so I started to learn like 180 on three stairs and then like hop whip. And I'm like, oh my God, this yeah. is so fun. And I started to go around Paris with them, explore. And this is whole, the whole new like sport honestly because flatland you just go to a spot and you train your trick and street is like you just pedal around with some dudes and and i learned like this and i started to mix street and flat and after that i i got on on harrow yeah which was like a blessing for me because i got to travel with dennis with chad with all those guys around the world and started to film video parts when in Flatland, you don't really film video part because it's more of a competition sport. Mm -hmm. Whereas street, you know, since the streets are so different in Paris than in Tokyo, than in San Diego, you always go places to film video parts. And I started to get into that like cycle. Yeah. And at the same time, trying to stay relevant in Flatland. So it, it was an amazing era for me. And I was starting to be like pretty, pretty all right at street, like jumping, I don't know. I'd, I 360 the uh, 15 stairs. I I did some big handrails in San Diego, and in 2018 I uh, had a pretty bad crash on my head, and that kind of freaked me out because mm. I broke my ankles like twice maybe, and wrist and ribs and everything. But this hill is like pretty nicely, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Just like because would you say that flatland is dangerous? No, it's not. Yeah. I mean, you can yeah like maybe break an ankle or whatever, yeah. but you cannot really like enjoy yourself straight. If you start to do some big stuff, you start to think if I miss this rail right now, like this is going to be pretty bad. And so it happened in yeah in January 2018 in the, in San Diego, and yeah, I crashed on my face pretty bad doing something silly. Like I was doing a nolly 360 down, I don't know, like five feet maybe, not so not a big drop, and I messed up and I yeah, ended up on my face, and that was like kind of a, a reality check huh, for mm. me. And I was like, ah, maybe I should take it easy. And I took it, I took it easy from there. <laughs> Easier. <laughs> How does, what is your relationship like to risk and reward? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I feel like so many, so many athletes, like that is always the question of, um, you know, how does, how do these athletes like get rid of the fear? I mean, even for me, like when I think of flatland tricks, I'm half of the reason it's gnarly is because I'm like too scared. Like what if I try to do a bar spin or something like that and the, bars don't go all the way around or something, you know? Yeah, it's really, really interesting because the more you are around people that are not scared, the, it's, it's not, not easy to understand, but let's say when I was in San Diego, I was staying in a house with Dennis and uh, Tyler Farnangel and Christian Regal. And those guys are, are going crazy every day. So your relationship to what's scary changes the scale like goes there you know so you watch those guys going crazy you're like i'm able to go crazy as well you know so you go crazy and so you don't realize that what you do is is dangerous mm -hmm. whereas if you stay by yourself or with some guys that are not pushing themselves you're like oh i'm the guy doing the craziest stuff so that might be crazy but when you are around people that are like so much better than you at what they do it's so inspiring and so that's how i got really hooked into street and I'm not a da daredevil, you know, yeah. I'm usually like a pretty chill guy, but being around those guys made me a bit 
more comfortable, you know? I, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's dangerous being around Danny. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Man, yeah, he's like in, actually insane. Just like the the gaps. And and I, it actually reminds me of um, like going to Red Bull Rampage as well. I don't know if you've been out there, but like you, I've, I've dug out there for a couple of people and you go out there the first time, you're on the edge of a cliff and you're like, this is insane. And then by the end of the week, you're like, oh yeah, it's like, 40 foot drop it's okay See, it's crazy like, yeah, yeah. Your, your relationship to what's scary changes so yeah. quick it's crazy so matthias i want to talk about everything else you do because you were a really good bike rider but i don't know if that is what makes you a superstar because i you've um you're into fashion, you know, you're, you've like done a full length film, you've done all of these other things. So like, how did that come to be? Like, how did you, a lot of athletes talk about kind of transcending their sport, but don't really achieve that. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because it all happened of, because of BMX in the first place. So the movie is a crazy story. Actually, I got to organize my own invitational competition in South of France in 2017. Um, so I got to invite all my friends. We ride in a crazy scenery and uh, the main sponsor, um, of the events, uh, was a phone carrier company and they invited some VIP from Paris to come and check out the event and everything. And so I, I, uh, we, we ride a contest. It goes well. And at the end of the competition, I grab the mic and I say a few words, like, thank you for everyone for coming. Thanks to my friends. And, and this lady came uh, to me and said, hey, I'm um, a uh, director, and I recognize her. She's a very famous director. I'm like, hey, how are you? And she's like, I'm doing the casting for my, uh, for my next movie that we are shooting in 2018. You could be like a great fit for the, for the main role. I saw you speak on the mic. You seem like you're... Oh, man, you mm, killed yeah, it. Good yeah. grief. I haven't had... I've been speaking on the mic for a while. <laughs> I haven't had any directors come up to me. And uh, and so, hey, come come to the castings to Paris. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. Like, whatever. And she... I'm like, here is my infos. I'm like, it's another, like... Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. 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 So, but, like, she hits me up. Hey, come to the casting. I'm like, ah, oh, you know what? So, she's, casting is crazy. Like, they basically send, send you, like, a, a little scene to learn from the movie. And... Uh, and you go do the casting. And uh, that scene I had to learn because the movie is called MILF and it's, uh, it's a relationship with three like men's like in their twenties and three older women. And the scene I had to learn for the casting was me doing the, the helicopter with my, <laughs> with my <laughs> and like because that's one of the scenes of them it's a it's a comedy that it's, was what the yeah. casting was yeah it's a comedy so i'm like okay great like let's go you know like i mean i've been under pressure my whole life in competition like I, i've got this and so like i go to the casting and it's literally like a room like this like there is a camera set up there and there is a, a casting director there exactly like you with with their sheet of paper and um, she's like, so stand there and we're going to do the, the scene. And I start to do the helicopter, whatever. And the room goes quiet. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great. This is, this is not going to plan. And the casting director is like, you have, the, have you done this before? I'm like, what do you mean the helicopter? <laughs> no, 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 no. Acting, I'm like, no, no, I've never acted before. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, this <laughs> and the director is here and uh and so, okay yeah yeah maybe like you should take some lesson and and the director is kind of blushing and i'm like oh <laughs> this is bad <laughs> and so so like i'm like okay peace guys and i think i'm never gonna receive like any because this went so bad like, yeah it was just one of my like worst moments <laughs> in life honestly uh but anyways the the director hit me back up and say okay uh, I've got this friend who's, uh, who's training actors and you should take some lesson for next couple of weeks and come back for a callback. So I take some lesson. I work on my, uh, on my little script that I, uh, so what I'm, I'm so fascinated. Like what is a acting lesson? Like what did they teach you? Uh, oh, so basically when you, when you think about acting, people think you have to be the most natural possible. Like let's say we are, acting to do a podcast right now mm. we're gonna be a bit tense because we are acting so this is not gonna come out as natural so what you have to do when you act 
is to force being natural. So you have to act natural, but literally. So it's weird because the camera like capped this. Yeah. So you have to kind of robotically learn and like, let's say I'm going to look right and then look at you and oh, then look at that mic. Because if, if we are being filmed, then I'm going to be like, oh, I just need to look at Elliot right now right, and like pretend right. we are. What is so the right thing yeah, to do during a podcast yeah, exactly. kind of thing? And uh, I'm, so I'm going to be like yeah. this. So you have to, it's posture is like eye movement is a rhythm because since you know already what you're going to say before you say it, then I might say it too quickly after you say it. So sure. it's not going to be natural. And it's like, whoa, so it's, it's actually a job. Yes, it's a, <laughs> it's a job. So we are working on all that. My posture, my eye movement, uh, my timing, also like how I speak, because when you speak from something you learn by heart, you, you, you speak funny, you know? Yeah, it's like, sure. so Elliot, today we are talking about BMX. And no, you're like, <laughs> so Elliot, today we are talking about BMX and yeah. you know, like your voice and sure. everything. And so this is incre incredible two weeks. I'm like learning so much. And I go back to the casting. I'm like ready, like, like if I was doing a Washington. Yeah, like <laughs> dude, I'm ready. And so they brought one of the main actress for the callback. And this time I'm doing the scene with her. And it goes great, like, because it's so easy to act with someone that's professional at it. It's like, uh, if you are doing a session with someone that's really good on the bike, you're gonna, it's gonna be a great session. Exactly like in a movie casting, I'm doing the casting with that woman who's doing that for 20 years and it goes incredibly well and I got the role. And it's like, oh, you've got the role, incredible. We start shooting in, uh, in September. Um, now it's August, so it's like, yeah, just don't get injured before September because, you know, the, the whole, like, production is counting on you. It's a 7 million euros movie, like... Hey, it's, and you're the star, like, one yeah, of the Yeah, one of like, the main, main role. I'm like, incredible, I'm going to be in a movie, whatever. And they say, don't ride competition, don't re-ride your bike until, like, for a couple of months, until the... The, the the shoot is here. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm not gonna ride my bike. Yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And so the Voodoo Jam is one of the biggest competition. Is on the 10th of September that year in 2017. I go ride the competition, and during practice, I kind of like crash, and my ankle goes on the peg, and I open the side of my ankle here, and I'm like, oh, it's fine, you know, I should be good. And I actually win the the competition, and I fly back to Paris. But then that same month, I had like another thing in Mexico and one thing in Dubai and another thing in Maryland. So within three weeks, I, I have like six uh, international flights. And you know, the air in flights is yeah, so bad. Yeah. And so like this little cut I had on my ankle, I didn't really take care of it. And it got infected. Oh, no. And so I go on the, I go on the set. I think it was September or like beginning of October. We are like October 2nd. And my foot's kind of swollen and it's like feels funny. And the morning of the first day of the shoot, I wake up with like the craziest fever. And my foot is like the size of an oh, elephant, dude. No. And I'm like, no, fuck, no, this is crazy. So I go on set, I'm like, I'm not gonna tell anyone. Like maybe <laughs> Maybe they won't notice. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's gonna get better, you know. And the first thing we do is like the first scene is we're on the tiny boat with those three like ladies and the boat's moving and I'm moving on my foot and I'm like, dude, I have like 120 degrees fever and dude, I'm dying. <laughs> and the director is like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, you're like this guy full of life usually and now you're like, oh, I have to show you my foot and I show my foot and it's so crazy, dude. It's, it's like literally an elephant leg that's red. So I'm like, oh, we bring you to the hospital. I'm like, oh, great. The whole production is look. There's literally like, 60 people from the production that are looking at me like I am no. like, I am a, you know, a traitor. Like yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm going to the hospital, uh, getting checked in the ER, and the doctor is coming in and looks at my feet, and all of a sudden, like, he calls all the interns, like, guys, come, this is crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> oh fuck. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, you have a crazy foot infection. You know, we have to look at that. So tomorrow we are going to have, we're going to perform surgery because the, the infection might, might have uh, reached uh, the ligament. And if it reaches the bone, 
we're gonna have to cut your cu cut your foot off. So we really have to to like perform surgery to see how how deep the the infection is. And I'm like, what do you mean? Say yeah. So you're gonna be able to work in like a couple of months. I'm like, no, but I have a, a movie shoot tomorrow. I, you can forget about that, son. I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> Director is with me at this very minute. And she's like, oh my God, oh my God. And you know, there is a whole plan of the, of the shoot, like every day, you know, different actors. It's a big movie. It's Netflix production, you know? And I'm like, oh no. So, okay, we're going to keep you uh, tonight and the surgeon is going to perform surgery tomorrow. So i'm in my room uh 6 a.m they come with a razor they shave my whole leg my left leg okay the surgeon comes looks at my leg and he's like oh it's not as bad that as the doctor told me we're gonna put you uh under antibiotic for one week and seal because i don't want to open your ligament and scrub it you know if it's not necessary i'm like oh thanks god so antibiotic for uh for for a week at the hospital so for one week, they changed the whole plan of, of shoot, you know, they, so they have people coming in from Paris that were not supposed to come and they wow. switch everyone. And yeah, yeah. so basically everyone is hating me and yeah. I'm making the, the production lose like tens of thousands of euros. And I'm like, but I'm at the hospital and my foot's getting better. Yeah. And so I come back to the, the shoot like one week after and the first thing they had me shoot was a sex scene. <laughs> I don't know if it was like uh, a revenge from them, but oh, no. so it was, dude, it was crazy. And from from this point on, everyone went great. Yeah, uh, the yeah. movie was like top three in the US, that uh, is top movie so in France, and wild. And that yeah, this opportunity was incredible because yeah, I got to do the whole promotion. Yeah, and then um, I met my wife through this movie because ah, really? uh, movie went really big in 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 France, so. She started following me on Instagram. I follow her back and we kind of uh, like hooked up because she saw the movie and, you know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that is so and, wild. And, uh, and she she's a model, so. Yeah, I she's moved, a huge, Constance is a huge model. So like. I moved to New York with her. And so one morning I go to, I go with her, with her modeling, ag to her modeling agency and um, and her, her, ad, uh, her agent is like, oh, we have a shoot for you next week and we need like a, 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 a guy in the shoot who's, uh, who's like acting to be your boyfriend. You think your boyfriend could be the boyfriend? And, um, and she's like, you want to act as my boyfriend in the shoot? I'm like, yeah, sure. And like, yeah, it's uh, one day, it's like 12,000 euros. I'm like, what, what? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's, uh, I'll do it. I'll uh, do okay, it. yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> and so after I do the... I do the the thing with her and it's super easy because we're just acting. And after that, the, the modeling agency is like, ah, you want to sign with no us? Way. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm a model now. And that's how the modeling thing happened. What a while. And Maybe you're just like incredibly good looking. No, Maybe no, that's no, no, the key. no, 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 not at all. I don't look like a model at all, but <laughs> modeling was, the movie was much funnier than modeling. Modeling so, is gnarly. It's really? crazy. Yeah. Why? It's just that, you know, movie is fun. You interact with people and everything. And uh, modeling is, yeah, you just, uh, you just a thing. And mm. it's like, yeah, look right. Ha, look happy. Ha, ha. Mm. Like it's, I don't know. It's not really creative. You are going to really be creative. Mm. And fashion industry is, uh, is a bit tough. Huh? I mean, yeah. my wife is incredibly like uh, simple. And the fashion industry is everything but simple. It's yeah. not really fun. Yeah. So it's too complicated and it's too much ego and everything. And yeah, even my wife starts, like she starts to work less because she's like, it's too, it's too chaotic. Like yeah. those guys, you know, and especially coming from uh, a BMX uh, background where everything is, you know, super core, super you right. know, simple. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And going into that industry was really a great experience because I learned so much from it, but I don't feel comfortable even today going to fashion dinners or fashion gala, I really try to avoid it because it's not fun. Like mm. it's Did really you, not fun. Have you done more, more acting and more like. I've, I've had some opportunities. Yes. But I don't know. This experience I had with the movie was so incredible. Yeah. You don't uh, want to, it's the, what's going to top yeah, that. Yeah. And what I love the most is to ride my bike, dude. Yeah. Like, and right. Right. It's just really like ride my bike. So yeah. I've get to do all these like fun stuff. And uh, from the movie, I learned so much and I created my own production company. And now I have my, uh, my academy in the, Cham in the Champagne region where we built an incredible facility for all sports and 
I feel like I have enough on my plate now. Yeah. Um, just modeling and acting is maybe something I, I might do later, but I, I only have 24 hours in my day. So. Yeah, man. <laughs> what a like wild life detour. Like it's, you know, it's crazy because it happens so organically. Sure. Always. I've never tried to be yeah, an yeah, actor. Yeah. I've never tried to be a model. I've never tried to be a BMX rider. It's just kind of universe is throwing things at you. And you, you just got to grab them. And you know, like, of course you have to provoke your luck and you have to be proactive. And, and my biggest advice to a kid who's listening to that podcast is just be a yes man. Like, mm. well, especially growing up, every opportunity that's throwing at you, say yes. Mm. It's, uh, unless it's, it's doing drugs or whatever, <laughs> like, obviously like bad stuff, but every like, business opportunity or mm. cool traveling opportunity say yes because you don't know what's going to lead you don't know what and by having this attitude i found myself in some sketchy situation i'm like why did i say yes to that but from that sketchy situation you learn so much stuff that you get you're gonna use in the future or if you say yes and then it's a good situation then you meet like an agent a producer a photographer and you build your 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 network like this and this is how life happens after just yeah be a yes man it can sound really cliche and corny but very important i i couldn't agree more like i the it's so funny you try to like plan your life out and you think like oh i'm gonna be here in five years and it you never end up there and it's almost like it's really good to not end up there and it ironically we're talking about this so you were part of the opening ceremonies at the games here in Paris. Like how, how did that happen? How did like your torch bear, like tell me about that. That is insane. Like home, hometown. Uh, exactly the same thing. I just told you, honestly, just received an email and said, you want to be a part of that? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, please. And reply to your email as well. This is one of the biggest advice. So many like pro athletes, they just received an email and say, uh, I'm going to go right. I'll check that later. No, reply to that email instantly because if you don't reply in the next hour, they're going to ask another dude. So yeah, I just received the email. Hey, you want to come to the Paris 2024 facility? We have a proposal. Yes, I I'll be there in five minutes. So I go there and the crew is there. You want to be a part of the ceremony? Please, yes, I'm going to be a part of the ceremony. And same like the tor torchbearer thing happened very like last minute. And uh, there was like one week before the, the torch came in Paris and say, hey, we have this opportunity for you. Do you want to be a torchbearer? And I had plans that day that I canceled. And I was like, yes, I'll be a torchbearer. And I mean, sitting in the bus with all the different torchbearers because it's a relay and all the relayers are going down. They're carrying the, the torch through the street. And I see the Eiffel Tower like coming in. I'm like, oh, we are getting close to the tower. <laughs> it's like, exciting. And I'm the only one in the bus left, you know, at the end. And it's like, oh, okay, Matthias, it's your turn. And we had the uh, Trocadero in front of the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, we have this little surprise for you. This is for all your achievements. We wanted to like acknowledge this. And uh, yes, here is your gift. So yeah, I'm with my bike and with a torch in front of the all like IOC and all the politics. And, and this is a huge moment for me, honestly. This was probably the biggest moment of my, uh, I can of imagine. my life. Yeah. It, was, it was huge. Because the symbolic of that, you know, I've my whole career, I tried to put BMX on the map and uh, and being there with Olympic Torch, Eiffel Tower and my BMX bike that yeah, did everything for me and with all the minist ministry and IOC members and everything. I was like, you know, one of these moments where you're like, I made it, you know, in all, you know, uh, modesty. But yeah, I, I felt really proud. Uh, in that moment. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I can't really imagine anything because like you said, it's <clears throat> there's a big difference between like winning a competition and having the bike, this thing that you like love, grew up riding, like get you to a place to where that's possible. <laughs> it's wild. I mean, what are you thinking about competing now? Like, I mean, I know that Flatland, what might be in for the next one? Yeah, uh, you know, the competition part uh, has changed a lot for me as far as I'm, I'm concerned, you know. I was very lucky to win a lot of competition and I still love to compete, but I feel like somehow this is not really my 
place anymore that I can do greater stuff for BMX than just being at a competition. And so I've decided to stop the official competition starting next year. You know, I'm going to go to the French uh, Nationals, the European Championship and the World Championship and the X Games uh, for 2024. And after that, I might take a little uh, break and see like what I can do for my academy, for my production company and for like young and upcoming athletes. And if uh, Flatland is incorporated uh, at the game in, in 2028, I'm, I'm going to try to get back into it. But we will see, you know, competition was everything for me up until like 2022, maybe. And I started to realize that it might be a good idea to, to stop at the top mm. and not do like that year too many. There is incredible riders now that are younger, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, way better than me technically. What am I going to win to like win another competition? Not much, but I can lose a lot by mm. not qualifying for the finals anymore. And that can hurt a little bit my legacy, you know? Sure. So I'm very happy with how I got competition wise and I've got big plans for the future for, for my life. So tell me like, what is, what is next for you, Matthias? Um, I really want to focus on that academy in, what in is Champagne. That? So we bought a farm with five associates and 15 acres of land. We renovated the farm and built some uh, sport facility on the 15 acres. So we have a, a big park, we have a pump track, we have a mountain bike track. Um, inside the farm, we're going to have a mash, martial art facility, a big gym, uh, and then we have like a road cycling uh, thing wow, around. That's, and so, that's so good. That's sick. So the idea behind it is to welcome uh, professional athletes for camps and uh, young, like up and coming athletes for like summer camp, like a woodward, but for yeah, yeah. all different sports, not only like gymnastic and, uh, and action sport, really like everything. And, uh, and also doing uh, seminaries there for companies that want to come and bond together. Mm. What, what, made you where did that idea come from it actually like uh this business opportunity uh, was offered to me by one of the founder of this project and it's like yeah at first they just wanted me to consult on the the sport uh, aspect and when they presented me the project and i'm very happy to invest some of my money into the project because i really believe in this one and yeah it's been two years you know it's a big project it's a five and a half million euros project and we are nearly uh, finished now. So early 2025, we are opening a big restaurant there with a, a very famous chef who's one of my friends. And, you know, it's that's what I mean. I can do like something greater for BMX yeah. and sport than just winning another competition. Sure. And that's my main focus now is to help having a, a crazy little camp where people can come and, and get better at sports. And because sport is, you know, it's life. There is nothing wrong about sports. <laughs> Man, what, what a great conversation, Matthias. Like I, I feel like I could talk to you for <laughs> another like hour, but this has been so good. Yeah, like, it's really fun. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you so much for coming on. It's awesome. Thank you so much, Elliot. And you know what? Uh, it's my son's name, Elliot. What a great name. It's a great name. Your son has the best name in the world. One L, two T? Oh. It's one L, one T. Oh, my you, you didn't man. quite spell it right, oh. but that's okay. I'll forgive you. Damn forgive it. you. <laughs> but no, dude, it's been, it's been an incredible uh, pleasure to talk with you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, you've been killing it with these and uh, keep, on, keep on doing them. It's really, really nice. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>